Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the drug treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so we've just discussed uh, the drug azathioprine, which, which works by uh, blocking this enzyme, amidophosphoribosyl transferase. Okay, and by doing that, you stop the synthesis of purine uh, nucleoside uh, triphosphates and also purine uh, deoxynucleotide triphosphates. Okay, so uh, this specifically is going to occur in B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes because they don't have uh, other mechanisms uh, for creating these purine uh, nucleosides uh, triphosphates and uh, purine uh, deoxynucleoside triphosphates. Okay, uh, and when you stop the production of these purine purine nucleoside triphosphates and purine deoxynucleoside triphosphates, uh, what happens is that you can no longer produce new mRNA and you can no longer produce new DNA strands, okay? So um, protein synthesis is halted and DNA replication no longer occurs, okay? And both of those uh, processes are necessary in order to get uh, cell division, so uh, azathioprine therefore prevents cell division. Okay, and this has an immunosuppressive action because, of course, the adaptive immune response relies upon cell division. Firstly, when you're activating T cells, remember what happens is the CD4 positive naive T cell, to take that example, firstly differentiates into a T helper naught cell and then proliferates into a whole population of T helper naught cells. And then these differentiate into T helper 17 cells mainly. Okay, and it's necessary to bump up the number of uh, T cells like that so that these uh, T helper 17 cells are actually <laughs> capable of doing something. I mean, if you only got one, it wouldn't be capable of doing much. Okay, so it probably wouldn't find the B cell that it needs um, to activate, and it probably wouldn't uh, be able to release that many cytokines to cause the bone degradation. Okay, uh, then also, when you're activating B cells, remember uh, what happens is this process of uh, affinity maturation, multiple step affinity maturation, where the B cell divides and divides and divides, and all of its daughters have uh, slightly mutated B cell receptors. Okay, and uh, again, if you block proliferation, then the B cell is not going to be able to divide and produce a whole population of B cells. So, again, you're going to block that uh, arm of the adaptive immune response. Okay, right, so we're now going to have a look at another drug, which is mycophenolate. Okay, so let's now turn our attention from azathioprine to mycophenolate. Okay, now mycophenolate is also called mycophenolic acid. And again, the difference between mycophenolate and mycophenolic acid is the same difference as you have between glutamate and glutamic acid. Okay, so mycophenolic acid is the molecule where you still have the proton attached, okay, and mycophenolate is the conjugate base where you've lost the proton. So in any uh, solution where you have mycophenolic acid, you'll also have mycophenolate present. So that's why the two can be used interchangeably. Right, so Basically, mycophenolate or mycophenolic acid is going to prevent the synthesis of uh, guanine nucleoside triphosphate, uh, sorry, rather, guanosine uh, triphosphate, and it's also going to uh, prevent the synthesis of deoxyguanosine triphosphate. Okay, so if you stop the production of guanosine triphosphate, then you're not going to be able to um, produce RNA. Uh, so you can't produce mRNA and therefore can't uh, produce proteins. And if you stop the production of the deoxyguanosine uh, monophosphate, then you're not going to be able to uh, produce new DNA strands because, again, guanosine, uh, sorry, deoxyguanosine triphosphate is necessary for the construction of a new DNA strand because roughly a quarter of the organic bases are going to need to be guanine along the DNA strand. Okay, so how does uh, mycophenolate prevent uh, the synthesis of guanosine uh, monophos? Oh, sorry, well, of uh, guanosine triphosphate and deoxyguanosine triphosphate molecules? Well, basically, it's going to work by blocking an enzyme known as inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase. Okay, so inosine 
monophosphate dehydrogenase is the target for uh, mycophenolate. Okay, monophosphate and then dehydrogenase. And um, inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase is often abbreviated to IMP dehydrogenase. So the inosine monophosphate will usually be abbreviated to IMP, like so. Right, okay, so... Um, we need to see what this enzyme does, and before we can see what this enzyme does, we need to see uh, what inosine monophosphate actually is. So, inosine is another nucleoside, okay? So, it's a ribose plus an organic base. So, inosine basically is ribose, and by ribose I mean uh, beta D uh, ribofurinose, strictly speaking. Uh, and then it's plus an organic base. Now, which organic base uh, is involved in inosine? Well, it's an organic base known as hypoxanthine. So it's a less famous one than the five that we've seen already, but it's still an organic base. Okay, so hypoxanthine here. So, um, basically, inosine is not an organic base. That's a common mistake people make, thinking inosine is the name for the organic base. Inosine is the name for uh, the nucleoside. It's the name for the organic base hypoxanthine uh, added on to the ribose. Okay, and we want inosine monophosphate, so we want the nucleoside monophosphate, which of course is a nucleotide. Okay, so we want inosine, which is ribose plus hypoxanthine, with a single phosphate group stuck onto it. Okay, so let's have a look at this structure. So we'll start off with the things we know, which are, uh, we know how to draw the uh, beta D ribofuranose. So here is the, goes the um, beta D ribofuranose. So we know these alcohol groups down here go into the page away from us. We know that the alcohol group here should come out of the page towards us, but of course we're not going to have an alcohol group there anymore. Instead, we're going to have the organic base, which I'll draw in a moment. And then again, because we're talking about D-ribofuranose, uh, the um, fifth carbon comes off towards us. It will have an alcohol group coming off us, which will then have a phosphate group attached to it via a phosphoester link. Okay, like so. Right, okay, so... Uh, now let's draw the organic base hypoxanthine. This was the simple part. We now need to discuss the organic base hypoxanthine. So hypoxanthine is what would be called a purine organic base, and I might as well take this opportunity to discuss what a purine organic base is. So a purine ring basically, because purine organic bases are all based on purine rings. So we need to discuss what a purine ring is, and in order to discuss what a purine ring is, we need to know what a pyrimidine ring is. So, I'm just thinking whether I want to put it here, because I would quite like to squeeze the reaction into here that the inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase is going to catalyze. So I might squeeze in my discussion of a purine ring up here, basically, so that I can squeeze the reaction down there. So, let's start off with what a pyrimidine ring is, then. So, a pyrimidine ring, and we'll draw the skeletal structure so that I don't have to show carbons. Basically, a pyrimidine ring is like a modified benzene ring. So, benzene is this six-carbon ring where you have alternating double and single bonds, basically. Ben uh, sorry, pyrimidine rings Instead of having six carbons, you have four carbons and then two nitrogens here, but you still have the alternating double and single bonds, okay? Now, we don't show hydrogens coming off carbons, okay, in, because we're drawing a skeletal structure. So, off this carbon, this carbon, this carbon, and this carbon, you've only got three bonds so far, so you'd also have a hydrogen coming off there, but we don't show that. And then these two nitrogens, they... Uh, are full, basically. They're fully um, saturated because they have three bonds, and that's the number of bonds nitrogen wants. So this is the structure of a pyrimidine ring. You have two nitrogens dotted into the benzene structure, basically. And they must be like so. So they must only have a single carbon in between them. So if you have two nitrogens put next to each other, and then the other four atoms as carbons, that is not a pyrimidine ring. They have to be oriented with a single carbon between the two. 
Okay, now, uh, purine rings are going to be made up of pyrimidine rings plus another type of ring. So I'm going to try and squeeze this other type of ring in here. So this other type of ring, I'm going to draw on a weird angle, but this will make sense in a moment. Okay, and it's called an imidazole ring. So an imidazole ring this time is going to be a five-membered ring. Okay, and two of the members are nitrogens, and the other three members are carbons. Okay, so this is going to be what's known as an imidazole ring. Now, it's not finished yet, okay? So we also need to put in some double bonds and some hydrogens. Okay, so there is a double bond here, and there is a double bond here, and this double bond here between the nitrogen and the carbon is what the um, ring is named after. So basically, when you have a double bond between a nitrogen and a carbon, that is known as an imide bond, okay? Uh, so, uh, that's why this is called an imidazole ring, because of the imide bond. And then dazole, anything to do with azo implies pertaining to nitrogen. Okay, so dazole kind of suggests two nitrogen atoms in this ring, so that's the logic in the name. So this is an imidazole ring, and it's almost complete, except for the fact that this nitrogen needs a hydrogen coming off it to fully saturate it. Now, the carbon here, the carbon here, and the carbon here, they all have a free bond remaining. They need one more bond, and of course that will be to a hydrogen atom. But we don't show that because we're drawing skeletal structures. So this is a pyrimidine ring, this is an imidazole ring. If you stick the two together, you get a purine ring. So basically, translocate this up here and stick it on there, and that will give you a purine ring. Now, where can I stick in the purine ring? Well, I'll try and no, this is just getting silly. Um, I know, I'll draw it... Oh, uh, no, no, because we don't have a pure purine ring in the structure of hypoxanthine. Okay, so can I go over the page? Uh, I'll draw it in this box here. We're not going to need this again. Okay, so the uh, purine ring is going to have this structure here. So start with the pyrimidine ring. Okay, so there's six-membered ring, two of the members are nitrogens, and then we've got these alternating double and single bonds here. Then we've got the imidazole ring here, which is this five-membered ring, like so. Okay, and uh, then we just need to show that hydrogen coming off this nitrogen. So that structure now is the structure of the purine ring. Okay, so it's got a pyrimidine ring, and then it's got this imidazole ring here. So that is what a purine ring is, and it is this structure that you're going to have within the purine organic bases. Okay, or at least a modified version of it. So, let's now draw this on here. So, it's the nitrogen of the imidazole ring that you're going to attach this alcohol group to. So. Remember, this nitrogen here was in the imidazole ring and had a hydrogen coming off it. Now, this carbon down here would have an alcohol group coming off it. What you're going to do is take the alcohol group off, take the hydrogen off here, put them together to produce water, and you're going to link the carbon to the nitrogen. Okay, so let me try and squeeze this all in here. So I'm it's going to be a bit of a squash, but I think we'll manage it. So here is the imidazole ring of the uh, purine ring, okay? So the five-membered ring, there's a double bond there, and there's a double bond here, which I'll show in a moment. And now let's put the pyrimidine ring on here. Okay, so here's the six-membered ring. We have nitrogens off here. Okay, you've got a double bond there, a double bond there, but this is where it's modified. You do not have a double bond here. Instead, you have a carbonyl group coming off here, and then a hydrogen coming off this nitrogen, okay? And that now is the structure of the hypoxanthine organic base. Okay, and the whole structure, hypoxanthine plus the uh, beta D ribofuranose, which we might just call ribose, uh, plus the phosphate, is inosine monophosphate. Okay, so what is inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase going to do to the inosine monophosphate? Well, basically, it's going to convert it into xanthazine monophosphate. And the way it's going to do this is it's going to change this organic base from hypoxanthine to xanthine. Okay, so let me show this. So, let me put the uh, phosphate group again on. Okay, so here's the phosphate group. Uh, here's the oxygen there. Oxygen down here. Off to the fifth carbon here. Okay, like so. That's coming out of the board towards us. And then we have uh, the 
beta D ribofuranose here, this five membered ring. Okay, uh, then we have the alcohol groups going back here, one here and one here. Okay, and now we need to show the structure of xanthine rather than hypoxanthine this time. Okay, so uh, basically the molecule we're going to create is going to be called, uh, yes, this is in view of the camera, uh, it's going to be called xanthosine monophosphate. So xanthosine is another nucleoside. It's the name for ribose. Oh dear, what have I done here? This isn't right. Mono, mono. Right. Um, so where was I? Xanthosine is the name for ribose plus the organic base xanthine, which I haven't shown you the structure of yet, but I'm just about to. Now I'm going to have to squeeze monophosphate in here. Okay, so xanthosine monophosphate is then the name for the nucleoside monophosphate, which is a nucleotide, obviously. All right, so let's try and squeeze in the organic base here. So it's pretty much the same structure. Xanthine is still a purine, so here's the imidazole ring. That hasn't changed at all, so there's a double bond here. Okay, the pyrimidine ring is almost unchanged, but something obviously has to change. Whoops, I've missed that nitrogen. Okay, there's the nitrogen. There's the nitrogen there. Okay, but something has to change, otherwise it would still be hyposanthine. Okay, so you still have this carbonyl group up here with a nitrogen bound to a hydrogen there. But now what you're going to have is a carbonyl group here as well. And this nitrogen is going to be bound to the hydrogen, but you will still have that double bond there. So you've lost this double bond here, and it's been replaced by this carbonyl group coming off here, uh, and a hydrogen coming off the nitrogen. So this organic base that we have drawn here, which is a purine organic base, is called xanthine. Xanthine bound to the ribose down here is then called xanthazine, and then once you've got xanthazine, which is the nucleoside bound to a phosphate, that's xanthazine monophosphate, and it will be abbreviated to XMP, like so. Right, okay, so, um, what do you have to have in order to do this reaction? Well, you put in water. Okay, so water goes in, so I'll draw the water molecule out like so, and you also put in a molecule of oxidized NAD, okay, so nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, and what you're going to get out is a molecule of reduced NAD. Okay, called NADH. Now remember, this notation is misleading because this suggests it's just got a single hydrogen atom when in fact reduced NAD has two hydrogen atoms. And remember what that means. It means it has two protons and two electrons. It hasn't just taken the protons, it has taken the full hydrogen atoms and the normal structure for a hydrogen atom, the protium isotope of hydrogen, has just a proton and an electron. So this is carrying two protons and two electrons. So let's try and make sense of this reaction. Okay, so firstly, it's going to help to just sort of break the skeletal structure a bit by putting a hydrogen there, so showing the hydrogen coming off that carbon. Okay, just to remind ourselves that it is there. Now, of course, this is breaking the rules for skeletal structures, but never mind. Right, now, again, I'm not going to show you a molecular mechanism because I don't know the molecular mechanism, but I'm going to help you make sense of this reaction. Okay, so... Um, what you can imagine doing is breaking the second of those two bonds between this carbon and this nitrogen. Okay, and imagine doing it by homolytic fission, and this is of course why this mechanism is nonsense, okay? It's not the real mechanism because homolytic fission doesn't really occur that often, okay? It's something that occurs in free radical chain reactions, okay? Um, so imagine sending one of the electrons back to the nitrogen and one back to the carbon. So remember, in a covalent bond there are two electrons, one from each of the two members of the bond. Okay, so we're breaking one of the two bonds that are between this carbon and this nitrogen. Okay, and you can imagine sending the electron from the nitrogen back to the nitrogen and the electron from the carbon back to the carbon. Okay, do the same thing for this bond between the hydrogen and the carbon. Okay, so give the hydrogen its electron back and give the carbon its electron back. Then take this hydrogen, which is a uh, proton uh, plus an electron, okay, 
take this and bind it to this nitrogen here, okay? Because this nitrogen has a free electron now because it's broken this uh, second of the two bonds between itself and that carbon, okay? So that forges this new bond here. Now this carbon still has two free electrons that it would like to pair up. What you're then going to do is imagine breaking up this water molecule here, again breaking these bonds by homolytic fission, okay, so giving one of the electrons back to the oxygen and one back to the hydrogen for both of these bonds. So that creates two hydrogen atoms, i.e. two protons with two electrons. Give those two protons and two electrons to the NAD to create reduced NAD. And then take this oxygen atom, which has two free electrons that it would like to pair up, and bind it to this carbon that also has two free electrons which it would like to pair up to create a double bond like so. Okay, so that's how uh, this reaction at least makes sense. That's not how the reaction actually proceeds, of course, uh, but it's how it makes sense, how what's on this side adds up to what's on that side. Okay, so this is the reaction that uh, I inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase um, uh, catalyzes, okay? And this molecule that you've produced here now, called xanthazine monophosphate, can then be converted further into guanosine monophosphate, okay? And that will be carried out by an enzyme known as guanosine monophosphate uh, synthase, okay? And then the guanosine monophosphate can be used to produce guanosine triphosphate, which is the thing that we need to make um, RNA. And it can also be used to make deoxyguanosine triphosphate, which is the thing we need to make DNA. Okay, so this reaction is essential to make the guanosine triphosphate that's essential for producing mRNA and also for making the deoxyguanosine triphosphate, which is essential for making DNA. Okay, so if you block this conversion by blocking inosine monophosphate, then you are going to stop the synthesis of guanosine triphosphate and also deoxyguanosine triphosphate and therefore you're going to stop the production of mRNA and also uh, the production of new DNA strands. Okay and that is how this drug mycophenolate blocks the synthesis of new DNA strands and new mRNA strands and thereby prevents cell division. Now the reason again that it's specific for uh, T and B lymphocytes at least to some extent is that other cells have alternative mechanisms by which they can create guanosine triphosphate um, and deoxyguanosine triphosphate molecules. Okay, so that's the mechanism of action of mycophenolate. That now um, concludes our discussion of the immunosuppressants. What we're going to move on to is other drugs that are not usually used uh, as immunosuppressants, but which are used uh, for uh, to treat rheumatoid arthritis. And some of them, as we'll see, do have immunosuppressive actions, although they're not classically considered immunosuppressants. And these drugs are all going to be in the category of disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Okay, so see you for the next video.